Oh, oh. Je m'appelle Bobby. Hi, this is Bobby. And this is a Megan. I know it's old now, but this is the 265. And that's the facelift version. I kind of like the pre facelift, but then the facelift looks, makes, I mean, refreshes the outlook of the car. And there are some nice, really, you no know, white bits in there. Of course, this is not the trophy version. The trophy was like a crazy, crazy car. This is the so called standard 265 RS. And it's a rapid car. I think all of you knew about this car now, right? It's still a lovely shape despite being introduced back in 2009. It still looks lovely. I really like this car a lot. And you know, now all that we have all the hyper hatches, right? All the hatchbacks that really can put power down. The Golf GDI Club Sport S, the uh, Mercedes A45 AMG, all, all those. I, I believe the tipping point whereby hatchbacks really went crazy is actually created done by this car of course hot hatches that, that category no doubt is created by Volkswagen the Golf GTI but and then throughout the generations they were really fun cars to drive and then you have the uh, Ford Focus RS and all that but this is the guy who who's not selling at a premium price and with front wheel drive and they engineered the car so well that it compelled everybody to really you know don't give yourself any excuses anymore. A torsion beam, front wheel drive, torque steer, all those negative thoughts. The French with this car actually throw everything out of the rule book and it made they, they created a car with on paper, doesn't look like much, right? As I mentioned again, torsion beam, front wheel drive. But this car has virtually no torque steer. There is a little bit, but virtually no. And it is in terms of dynamics. It is ahead of its time back then. So let's go and have a look and have a drive. Holy, do you see that? That's a wide body Sylvia S15. Some rocket bond bunny stuff, but it looks damn cool. Super cool. Yeah, <laughs> super cool. Spit me some fire! Spit me some fire! Alright, let's be sensible. Um, this is the Megan. In fact, the facelift of the first gen. 265. Now I remember back in 2009 when it was first launched it was such a revelation because back then 2 liter turbo GTI producing 211 horsepower is a big thing but this guy came with 250 and we were all gobsmacked by it because uh, first of all there is little to none there is a little top steer when it comes to really powering and low gears and all that. Um, the second thing would be being a front wheel drive, this car doesn't exert the type of familiar behavior we've had from Golf GTIs or Audi A3 2 liter turbos, A4 2 liter turbos. You know, that time, all of us were, we, we've gotten so familiar, familiarized with. The VAG group handling. And then this boy just came in and swept everybody sideways and show everyone what a two liter turbo car, two liter turbo hot hatch can do. I believe the Megan is the car. I mean, no doubts about the Golf GTI's importance in, in the grand scheme of hot hatchery, history of hot hatchery, but to in, in the past 10 years, what really made everybody progress so much in terms of handling, in terms of uh, putting power down, achieving a great balance in in in, in um, how would I put this in, in, in the way the car behaves? Um, I believe the Megan RS is actually the V car that I believe BMW, Mercedes Benz. 
uh, Audi, everybody bought one back to study. Okay, that's that's that, there's no fact to, to back that up, but uh, this is the car that made every one of us move. Of course, there are those that are more capable, but all of them at one point had to resort to four wheel drive, right? The R32, um, the Ford Focus RS, all of them have to resort to four wheel drive to really put power down. And back in that era, it was the Golf Mark 6 GTI and the Golf, uh, Golf R, the Mark 6 Golf R. I'm not sure if you will agree with me, but all of us who drove the Mark 6 Golf R never really liked it because it, it the whole car just feels less nimble. The, the whole car feels more, yes, it is more planted, but it, it feels less nimble by far. And this boy here, um, what should I say? Well, it's been a while, but um, to me, the interior still looks really fresh. It still looks really fresh. It still looks very um, dynamic, very sporty after all these years. I mean, yes, we haven't got the new Megane yet. Asia, um, because of Renault's low presence and you know their cars don't really sell well here you know, because they have the excellent after sales service the fluence you know Renault did a reasonably good enough job in reviving itself in Malaysia um, under under the leadership of a guy who is um, we, we know him personally he is a proper proper car guy all his cars are manual and um, he really revived Renault as a brand that, that uh, for drivers, for people who are different, you know, they, yeah, they did it really well. And if you haven't heard about it, Renault Malaysia has one of the best after sales service. Yeah, European brand, smaller volume than all the, the, the non-premium ones, but they, amongst car owners, the feedbacks from car owners, they have, a, they have exceptional uh, after-sales service, a very personalized approach. Of course, uh, as the volume grows, you're not sure whether that can be maintained. But so far, uh, it's a good and bad thing for, for Renault, you know. Now, this car, I, I absolutely adore it. Um, back when, it, when the 265 came out, this is the 265, right? The 250 came out first, then the 265. When the 265 first came out, that was about the time where Toyota brought out the, um, they, they brought in the 86. Maybe the 86 arrived later or something like that. They brought out the 86. I actually wrote an article that is titled Born or Bred, you know, as in B-R-E-D, Bred. What, what I really want to say is that in that article is that, yes, both are great cars, but the 86 was born with it. What do I say so? Front engine, rear wheel drive, uh, natural balance architecture for a rear wheel drive sports car is easy to it's easy to achieve what Toyota set out to achieve for the 86, given that inherently it is born with that in it, right? But whereas the Megane, if you if you simplify everything, it's a front wheel drive hatch. With a torsion beam, right? To for for the French to achieve that kind of driving behavior, that kind of fantastic handling, neutral behavior, the car pivots around the driver's seat is amazing. It's bred, you know. They they really know their shit. They went through a lot. They that kind of effort. If it were to be put into a car with an architecture that was born with, God knows how far it go. Um, yeah, so this car is an exceptional front wheel drive hatch, a hot hatch, and I was having a spirited drive just now, but now I'm stuck in jam. And what, what kind of idiot will bring viewers to to watch a Megan RS two six five review in the traffic jam? Now, since we're in the traffic jam, let's talk about manual in the traffic jam. It's almost like a taboo, right? Everyone is like, um, 
Wow, you bought a manual? Are you mad? Have you not heard of traffic jams? Or, wow, you can drive a manual. You're so cool. Well, guys, um, go home. Your grandma, your akong ama, your your pachi, pachi, yang the one that the draw durian at the roadside, you know, chendo or whatever. All of them can drive manual. Yeah, perfectly well, and they've never complained. And to say that we have bad traffic, our traffic has improved a lot compared to let's say ten years ago, right? So. I don't see driving manual in, in a daily commute as being a big problem because um, first of all, it's, it's more engaging and guys, all of you who, who are stuck in traffic jam day in and out, don't tell me your right foot doesn't hurt. You know, throttle, brake, throttle, brake, throttle, brake, it's operated solely by one foot. Uh, manual drivers will know this. There are times you can do that. There are times you can you can use your left foot to just release the clutch, and the car will inch forward for you, right? And yeah, I I don't see driving manual in in a daily condition as being too much of a hassle. But unfortunately, um, that's not the case now. Everyone just um, prefers auto, and of course with excellent dual clutch transmissions like the. DSG and all that. It's very hard to argue getting a manual now, but the level of engagement, the way the way you roll your own gears and all that, is just very very nice. Yeah, I, I really miss this. Um, sometimes it's not that we don't want to buy manual cars. There are no manual cars for us to buy, and cars like that, yes, exceptional. But when you're a family man. Um, Two door, four seats. I mean, if you're a young family, it's still alright, you know, because the rear seats of the Mangan is actually quite spacious and the boot is quite usable, it's big, it's considered big for, for this kind of car. So, the Mangan, can you live daily with it? I'm sure you can. Um, is it the best daily transport compared to all the other cars out there? Of course, it's not, but it, is it one of the most enjoyable cars to drive? It is, it definitely is, even a used one. And the last thing, don't believe what the British said. You know the Brits, they all, they all like to laugh at French cars, saying that they're not reliable, they fall apart, blah, 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 blah. They're all bullshitting, you know. The Brits can't build cars. They can't build proper cars. But because of the superiority of their English language, they can say bad things about the French without the French knowing it. All right, my experience, French cars are more reliable than British cars. They are better put together. They know cars, car making way better than the Brits. The Brits, yeah, I mean, when it comes to uh, snobbish brands and all that, no one can match up to them, right? Creating that kind of ambience and all that. Aston Martin, Bentley, Rolls Royce, they're good at that. They're good in that kind of marketing their craftsmanship, blah, 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 blah. The, basically, to to guide you to the way to become a snobbish, you know, wealthy millionaire, the Brits are, are, are really good at that. But when it comes to really making day-to-day -day cars, cars that are that last, cars that drives really well, exceptionally designed interior, check out the new Peugeot 3008 interior. Come on, man. You, you, you guys check it, check that out in YouTube or whatsoever. Audi can take second place when it comes to interior design, interior build and all that. My god, the Peugeot, that interior is just out of this world, it's straight out of concept car territory. They put it in a production car, in a mass market car, in a car that doesn't cost a lot more than say a Tiguan, you know, or a Ford Escape. Yeah, so yeah, the French are really good in car making. Um, my family, when I was a kid, my, my dad has a Renault Megane Scenic. Nowadays, we hear Megane and we go like, wow, wow, performance, wow. Back then, Megane is almost like a brand and then you have sub-brands, you know. Megane Scenic, uh, Megane something. I don't know why is their obsession with that. That car is reliable as dude, you know. That car is freaking reliable. Except the air conditioning is really bad. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think the jam's done. Holy 
holy shit, that's a new Passat V8 and it's fast. Oh, that's an S class, I thought it's a C class. This car is just so nice. I'm in a Megan, I can't catch up to the Passat V8. Uh, <laughs> I can't catch up. Total correct gear, I, I, I couldn't catch up with on a straight line. Wow, wow, wow. It's how far things have come, huh? On the hot hatch, that's a D7 family sedan. Couldn't catch up with it at all. Straight line, of course. Yeah, that's about it, I guess.